I have the wonderful privilege of being here with the one and only Mary Lemmer. Mary, thank you so much for being on the Middleway Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I wanted to get into your entrepreneurial background to start off uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's very multifaceted. Um, it's also been very inspiring to me as someone who is now pursuing a more entrepreneurial path. Um, but to do that, I actually was hoping to start with your most recent experience going over to Africa. Mm. And I wanted to, I was hoping you can share a little bit with the listeners about what you were doing over there and how that opportunity came to be. Yeah. Wow. Uh, there's so much to say about Africa. I will start by saying I went to Zambia and South Africa specifically within Africa and, I was invited to go as part of a professional fellowship with the State Department. And this came about because my first entrepreneurial venture and probably I guess longest standing now at this point was a gelato business that I started as a teenager about 20 years ago. And now I've aged myself. So there you go, listeners, <laughs> you can do the math. And this particular program is to have professionals in the world of food and agriculture support food and agriculture entrepreneurs in Africa, uh, specifically in the countries of Zambia, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, and South Africa. And there were a, about a dozen entrepreneurs from those countries that came to the US earlier this year. And I got to be paired with one fellow, one entrepreneur and learn more about her business and her life and then show her our business, the gelato business and different food and agriculture businesses in the States. And then the second component of that was then going and visiting these businesses in Zambia and South Africa to go see them in the wild, right? And see them in on the ground and how they're operating, what, what are the conditions there and to really get some more context so that I, as a, a mentor and person to support them and help them grow their businesses, has so that I can better help them, right? Because what we have here in the US in terms of resources and um, possibilities are different, right? And so going there gave a new perspective as to what is available to help them with their businesses and what kind of circumstances they're are in front of them um, that are maybe different than what they are here in the States. So you mentioned, Mary, your gelato business and actually going over there to help other entrepreneurs in the food industry to help start up their businesses. Can you take us back to the beginning of your sort of entrepreneurial career and what that was like for you um, as a business person um, and yeah. lessons learned and how that eventually grew into the work that you do now. Mm, how much time do we have? <laughs> we got as, as much time as, as you're able to give us. So I'm, yeah. I'm here for it. Yeah, well, I like to say I just didn't know any better. Uh, when I started my first business, right, I was a teenager, 14 years old, and I kind of came from two things happening in my life. One was I had grown up visiting family that was from Italy that had you know come to the States and I would go visit them and they had this Italian heritage and culture that is also my heritage and culture. And I'd get this Italian water ice out on the East Coast in Philadelphia and New Jersey and I couldn't get it back in Michigan which is where I was going to high school. And so I remember asking my parents, like, where can we get this? And they'd be like, you can't, if you want it here, you have to bring it here kind of thing. And I was like, oh, how do I do that? Like, I'll start a business, right? So that was kind of part of that initial inspiration of like, oh, I liked this thing that I had as a kid. I couldn't get it in my hometown in Michigan. And the other factor was like, I couldn't get a job. Like I was 14 years old and I had no work experience, right? Which of course, no 14 year old is gonna have work experience. And so I remember applying for like a cashier job at like a market um, and 
perhaps another like retail job or something. And I remember like not getting them because I didn't have enough experience. And I remember being like, well, what do you expect? Right. And how much, like, aren't I supposed to learn that? Like how to be a cashier. So I remember being kind of frustrated by that. So I think those were like the two things happening to be like, well, look at, I can't get a job elsewhere. Here's an opportunity to create my own job and find and do some work. And that was really the initial inspiration. And and then it kind of just went from one thing to the next with, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was figuring it out as I went along. I didn't, I hadn't gone to business school. I'd never started a business before. Uh, I had so much support from my family to get started. I mean, I didn't have a driver's license. So my parents would have to drive me to different events that I was catering with this frozen Italian ice gelato cart. And you know, doing open houses or private parties or music festivals and and they'd have to load me all up with the stuff in the car and and sit there. So I definitely could not have done it without the support of my parents um, early on. And it was just this, you know, I did this on the weekends and the summers. It's a way to make money and I had fun with it. Right. I learned so much because I'd be I mean, one, working and standing on my feet for like 12 hour days sometimes, right? So this, there's an element of hard work and like a work ethic that I think I learned really young. I also learned how to like tell people about something that they didn't know about, right? No one in Michigan had ever had Italian water ice or even gelato when we started introducing that because it wasn't really a thing there. This was the whole reason I, couldn't find it before. So that like education piece and, and then the third big thing, and there's so many things I've learned along the way, but I think the big thing that certainly relates to a lot of what we talk about is things that I can't control. Right. And there were so many things that happened that were out of my control and stuff that I couldn't have expected that brought up challenges or opportunities. So there was so much just navigating and figuring things out as I went along, because again, I didn't, I hadn't done this before. I didn't have a path or like certain things I knew like, oh, this will work. It was just a lot of let's try this, let's try that. Right. And uh, I think that's how a lot of great ideas came to like help grow the business too, because it, free samples for example like i think when we started we weren't necessarily giving samples but then once we started sampling it people could try it like oh, i actually want a cup of this because they could taste enough to be like oh i like this whereas before they're like i've never had this before i don't know if i want to get a whole cup of it so there were a lot of unique things we did too that were born out of not knowing and i think i learned how to be better at not knowing but this is also what kind of led to my work today because I struggled with that for so long, like the not knowing piece. And when stuff would break or someone wouldn't show up for work or uh, something didn't go as planned, it would really stress me out. And, and I tried to do so much myself. I wasn't really great at asking for help or building an ensemble around me as we would say in the improv world, right? And so I, I kind of hit breaking points and that's what inspired me to find something in my life that could be kind of a fun outlet. And I'd always had an interest in performing. I think if you would have asked me as a kid what my dream job was, I probably would have said a writer and an actress, right? Growing up in Northern Michigan and just like seeing people on TV. and. And so I always had this kind of interest in performing, but I was always a very shy kid. So I didn't really, you know, do plays and stuff as much as perhaps other people did. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to sign up for an improv class. This looks fun. And, and sure enough, that improv class was fun. And it also helped me manage this part of my life or get better at managing all of the change and uncertainty and things outside of my control that were such a struggle for me right because in my business i was constantly strategizing or like thinking like what how do i do this what's the right thing to, to say or do how do i position this so it's really in my head a lot and in and kind of 
in an overthinking way, perhaps of like, am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Like, is this going to work? Right. And in improv, everything you say is okay, right? There's no right or wrong thing to say. So I immediately felt this like relaxation of like, oh, wow, this is nice. Like, I don't have to over, I don't have to overthink. I just have to show up and be me and that's enough. Whereas in the business world and as a young entrepreneur, I was like really concerned about how, how am I supposed, how am I supposed to do this? Right. And, and I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, so that kind of these worlds I started bringing together because it was so helpful to have that tool to like help me navigate things I couldn't control, kind of the ability to improvise in my business, right? And see where things go and take things as they come and don't resist the thing that is, right? And just deal with it, say yes and solve the problem. So, you know, and we can go into deeper into that if you want, but it was just like that, that's kind of what led me to this kind of insight of like, oh, this is a really helpful tool for managing change, managing uncertainty, innovating, right? And that had that helped then get that business to where it is today, where we went from, you know, one little food cart to having multiple gelaterias or scoop shops and making pints for grocery stores. And it wasn't a linear path. There was a lot of improvising along the way and problem solving and navigating unexpected situations. But I do credit that improvisational tool set for helping get there because otherwise it would have been too many breaking points right and too much stuff falling apart and without that ability to say okay and now what do i do how do i manage this change how do i manage this new direction where do we go from here in kind of a calmer state i mean that was everything so Mary, it sounds like for you, even very early on as a teenager, when you were starting to develop your business, which is so impressive, by the way, you were already, these lessons of improv were kind of right in front of your eyes there about being flexible and trying new things and not knowing. Um, but for you taking that improv class actually helped. <laughs> Sorry. Are the bars back? <laughs> they're they're back <laughs> so, oh my god so i want to i want to keep rolling and we're just gonna incorporate this into into the conversation here so just to let in our our uh listeners here there's some some bars that are being installed right outside my window now and some some people uh here with us um hopefully it's not too distracting for you for me, it's a little distracting, but I would not, I would rather, I would not rather have this conversation with anyone else than you, Mary, <laughs> while this is happening, because this is essentially what we practice is how to roll with things that come up and deal with unexpected things and to take it as a gift. So here we are and, uh, we're going to, we're going to roll with it. If that's cool yes. with you. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm glad we brought the audience in on this little secret we have that this is happening. The audience as well. is, <laughs> has peered behind the curtain and uh, is aware of what's going on here. So, uh, but it's but it's all good. This is this is life happening all around us. And although I would have wished this episode would have had a lot of peace and quiet around us, um, then we're gonna we can practice what we preach here. Yes. So. Yeah. So those seeds were planted for you, but when you actually stepped in and took that first improv class, it sounds like that was actually kind of really brought to your awareness. Some of the things that were already happening to you, or you were already practicing as far as how to show up uh, to business and then how to take those tools and embrace them and really apply them in a more serious way. So I want to yeah. get into that a little bit more and to hear more about improve. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us about that first improv class though, like where did you take it and why did you first des decide to sign up for that first class and what was that like for you in class and, and afterwards? Mm. Well, it was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it was a community improv class taught by Mike Fidel, shout out to Mike Fidel. Um, and I decided to take it after 
I, what I would describe as one of probably many breaking points, but it was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back as the saying goes, because I had been living a life that involved getting up at like 6 a.m. and I would go teach indoor cycling classes. This was pre Peloton, <laughs> but it was like indoor cycling classes um, that I taught in the mornings often. And then I was working at a venture capital firm where we were investing in high tech startups and fast growing companies and early stage companies. And I would go there from like 8 a.m. to about you know, 8 p.m. depending on the day, right? But I was there for the day. And that was also filled with a bunch of unexpected twists and turns and things outside of my control. And then after that, I would go work with the gelato business, right? And at the time, we were opening our first standalone store in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where before that, we had always had like our cart, we had had a cart inside of a market, but we had never done our own shop so my days were packed and they were very regimented and very scheduled like i joke but it's kind of serious like my calendar looked like someone threw up on it you know it just had like so much stuff everything was different colors and i'm a highly organized person as uh, people who know me will say i reek of spreadsheets you know they just can tell that i'm like really organized and it's true and i've always been an organized person so i would I'd have my days like really scheduled and that meant that if something didn't go as per the schedule, it would domino affect everything else, right? If one meeting ran over, then everything else would get pushed behind or something I'd have to move. So I was already having to improvise, right? We all do, whether we realize it or not, but the, the thing that was happening pre improv class was that it was really stressing me out like it would just it it would affect me you know really I wasn't great at just like all right let me just go with the flow I would be like oh my god you know and it would just really it would I don't think I handled it as calmly as I did after the improv class so there was one day just to give you that context right that's what my life looked like there was one day in particular it was so memorable because I got up in the morning and I ended up going to the gelato shop um, and drove by and the person that was supposed to open the store wasn't there. So I, you know, start texting to see where this person was. I end up going in to open the shop while I figure out what's going on here. I walk into the shop, the POS, you know, iPad system is the iPad is shattered and I'm like, when did this happen? No one told me about it. So here I am, like two things have already happened in my day that I wasn't prepared for, like someone didn't show up for work. I had other things I had planned to do and now the iPad's broken. So instead of doing all the things I had planned to do that day, I ended up at the Apple store after that person who had slept in came in and took on his shift. So I went to the Apple store, did that, fix that, I come back and I'm exhausted, right? Because as you heard, my schedule was insane and I was not sleeping enough and taking good enough care of myself. And so I came back, I was stressed. I like went up to the office, I laid on a bean bag and I remember kind of cry crying because my nose started bleeding. I had this nosebleed and I'm like tired. My day just complete, completely derailed, right? And probably the compounded derailed days over time really influenced this kind of breaking point for me. And I remember one of our employees coming upstairs and seeing me this way, right? Kind of tears exhausted bloody nose and she's like mary go home like rest like take care of yourself and i remember feeling quite embarrassed right like here i am the lead quote unquote leader of this business and i wasn't even i was not setting a great example right and wasn't able to show up in a way that i would like to so that was like this moment of just being like, I have to make some changes. Like I can't keep sustaining this way that I'm operating in my life, in my work. And so I took a unplugged trip to Mexico and gave a list of all the things I was doing to the, at the gelato shop to our, you know, top employee. And I said, Hey, I'm going to go away. You can't reach me. Do this 
I trust you to figure out anything else. Like, here's the things you need to do. And then when I came back from that trip, that's when I signed up for that improv class, because during that time, I realized I needed to do things that weren't just work, right? And I needed to take some time to just have fun and do something that I thought was interesting or that would bring me joy. And that I opened this computer community pamphlet and there was the improv class and I'm like, this looks cool. You know, I had taken acting classes at a local theater, Purple Rose Theater uh, in Chelsea, Michigan. And I like, like that was fun. I made good friends and learned a lot about myself. And it was like a nice creative expression. So I think that was kind of, that was just like in the back of my head. I knew I liked that. I saw that and it was just like, okay, I'm going to do this. I didn't really, I honestly didn't think much of it. I wasn't trying to achieve anything other than just like just something fun that I could do because I knew that I needed to start doing that for myself to take care of myself in this like high octane high intense work situation that I had put myself in and that was that was that that's why I did it and that's in and that moment was a big shift for me and how I showed up in my life in my work and now over the course that was you know 2011 so it's been over 10 years of just continually practicing on practicing what i've been learning in like practicing and improv in my life and kind of incorporating that and just and i think improv gives that venue for practicing the things that i already was doing as a business owner but doing it in a way that allowed me to do it in a way that didn't get me stressed out because it's such a low stress environment the stakes are so low so that when i went back into the quote unquote real world and i was handling things that didn't go as planned it's like my body and my nervous system knew that it could just be relaxed and handle that right it didn't have to get all flustered by it it could just be Mm -hmm. like all right this is a thing that's coming up and i think that was the that's like the biggest shift i think that's happened over the past 10 years of using those techniques is just building the resilience and adaptability that doesn't it's like okay like truly go with the flow right someone's putting bars on the window and it's loud or there's like you know there was people trimming trees the other day and i had zoom meetings and like all right this is it's not i'm not gonna let it get to me because why i can't change it <laughs> so i think that's the thing that that's really cool about practicing improv and how it started to help me as an entrepreneur that was already having to improvise, it just helped me better handle th- those things that were not going as planned. That's incredible, Mary. And um, I'm wondering if I could even, if if you could stretch that out for us even more, um, because it sounds like, I think, first of all, when a lot of people think about improv, they think about the performance as- aspect of it, which is certainly there. But something that you and I talk about and are so passionate about is how improv can really affect our everyday life. It can change our experience of life. And you've spoken really well to how this has affected your entrepreneurial uh, path and how you've shown up as an entrepreneurial as an entrepreneur. And and then you mentioned this piece also just individually, how it's allowed you to kind of go with the flow more and be less reactive to things. Can I pick your brain even more to hear about some other ways that improv has changed you as a person and the way you show up in your everyday life, or Mm -hmm. at least how people can think about improv as sort of a personal development or, um, yeah, as, as a very personal practice? Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways. I think it comes down to it's made me a better listener and someone who listens like differently right before i i think it's like listening fully to what someone's saying and not just what they're saying but how they're saying it and then being able to respond to that because i think i've always i've always been a really sensitive person um i think there's now like highly sensitive person is an actual uh term and it's more research and everything and i am a very sensitive person um And so I have, I've listened, I've noticed nuances and how people communicate, but I haven't always been able to like respond to that, right? If I sense that someone's upset with me, for instance, 
I used to like hold that in and just like build this story in my imagination, like, oh, this person's upset with me and here's all the reasons why, you know, and, and it would, it would start to be internalized when that person never said that they were upset with me. Right. It was just something that I perceived and what I've learned in improv and improvising one is most people are totally unaware of how they show up (laughs) and they may seem like they're sad, but they're just, they're just not smiling, but they don't, doesn't mean they're not happy. Right. It's just sometimes our, how we are is not congruent with how we present to the world. So um, that's why we don't take, we don't need to take things personally. Right. I definitely learned not to take things personally. But the second big thing is I learned how to then communicate to, to debunk that story, because I think before I would make a lot of assumptions based on what I sensed and heard or listen in, and in improvising, I developed more maybe a confidence of just being like, it seems like you're upset with me. What's going on, right? Because in an improv scene, we use, that's a gift. If someone gives us that facial expression or that vibe, we would totally use that and say something, right? But in life, all those judgments and uh, roadblocks of just like, oh, I can't say this or the insecurities come up or the fears of like how this person is gonna respond. And when we improvise, those kind of sift away because we actually need to call those things out in order for the scene to move forward. And those are gifts to the scene. And they actually are gifts in life too, because it's, it provides clarity on both parts, right? It's they're just conversations. And I used to get really in my head about conversations and, and I still, like that's still something I work on. It's still something I use these tools for to um, help with those types of conversations or situations. And I think one of the big differences is the more I've improvised, the more I've developed this trust in myself that I can handle whatever someone says in response to something, right? Because we can't always, we can't control things outside of us. We can't always trust things outside of us or that someone will show up in a certain way or respond in a certain way. But if we build that own self-trust that like, okay, whatever comes up, I have the ability to handle it. I have the ability to respond. Um, I have the tools to show up whatever the circumstances. That is definitely something that's shown up differently in my life because before it was like, again, that, that strategizing of like, well, if this happens, like, what would I do? And like kind of thinking through all these possible scenarios and trying to plan for things that haven't even happened yet. And the reality is like 99% of worries never actually are actualized. So it ends up being like a lot of time and a lot of mental energy going towards something that may not ever happen. And while that's a gift for, sometimes business and strategy and thinking through possible scenarios, it's not always the best way or most efficient way or most calming way to show up in situations. So I think in my life, I've become less of a planner or perhaps like I plan differently, like I'll have a schedule for the day or things that I wanna do, but if something doesn't happen as I thought it might, I'm just like, okay, I'll just move it. Or it, it's like, what's really important and how to really balance these things that before I might get really worked up about. Um, but, and then like trusting myself in conversations to just have that tool to, to notice things and be able to take that moment of, okay, how do I want to respond? And then respond, right? It happens a little slower, I think, than it does in improv scenes where it's like that immediate emotional reaction. Whereas now I can break that down into, okay, we notice something, we feel something, we have that moment of like, how am I going to respond? And then making that choice and actually responding. And pre-improv, I would just notice it and like not do the other things. (laughs) You know, I wouldn't necessarily engage in a conversation because I'd want to like think about the conversation before I'd actually have it. And now I'm like, let's just have it, right? Because we're here, we're in this scene, let's do this. And being able to dialogue about feelings, um, feeling feelings and communicating about them for sure has been something that uh, improv helped me with. 
all across the board, right? Instead of shoving them away or neglecting them to be able to say, hey, when you did this, it made me feel this way, uh, was not something I was doing regularly or probably well before I started taking improv classes because I didn't also let myself feel certain feelings. And I remember my acting coach and improv instructors being like, you need to be bigger, like express feelings bigger. Like, how do you feel? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I remember some of those exercises being some of the hardest where they're like, how do you feel in your body? And I'm like, fine. You know, <laughs> it wasn't because I didn't have that intelligence. Right. And it is, it is a mindfulness or it is an awareness. And I had spent so much time up in my head that I did kind of, I just kind of, you know, and I'd been an athlete where it's just like, you kind of just go right. And didn't always take a beat to be like, huh, what do I feel? But when we improvise those feelings are gifts, right? And we want to feel them because it evokes and allows for these really fun scenes. So I learned to take my emotions. I was able to take my emotions to attend to that extreme heightened state so that then in my real life, I was not at a one anymore. I was maybe at a four or I could like oscillate between that range to really be like, oh my God, I'm so excited about something. And then also be able to be like, hmm, I'm like sad, right? And express so many different emotions at different levels, whatever the context allowed for. So I know that I just kind of basically threw a bunch of things all at once, but those are some of the ones that come up of just ways that it's helped me showed up differently and impacted my life and work uh, post starting to take improv classes and practicing improv regularly in life and on stage and taking those skills off stage. That's amazing, Mary. And the communication piece is something that I really not only appreciate, but admire in you as well, um, how that has developed for you. And um, it sounds like what has happened for you is what we might even call mindfulness, more awareness of what's going on for you internally, your emotions, your thoughts that are coming up. And I just want to go back and put a pin in one of the things that you said, which is that 99.9% .9 of the things that happen for us in our head that we're imagining about the future never happen. Yeah. It's just like major reality check for all of us. It never happens the way that we think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. even if we have a really good, I mean, it's just, we literally cannot know the future. And for you, it sounds like being aware of the fact that your mind is going to these places and being able to kind of bring it back and check the stories around it and stay present in the moment. And then even in those conversations has been such a helpful tool. Um, and it's, that's, I mean, incredible. What a, what a helpful skill to have as a human being walking around with this, flesh in our head that all it does is it it's just a it's a thinking machine and i know all of us can relate to that it's a meaning making machine absolutely and it i think it's one of the biggest challenges perhaps in just society right is the stories that come up in our head that aren't based on any they're based on like little pieces, but not the full context, right? And I still, I mean, it's still something that I struggle with because I think, and maybe perhaps people can relate to this, especially that have big imaginations or really creative because that is a gift. But if you can imagine all these things, you can imagine your imagination is powerful. Our minds are powerful, right? And they create these narratives that can either serve us or, you know, slay us, <laughs> you know, it can just, <laughs> really oh, right like it's really wild and I try to remind myself for anyone that does struggle with this whether you find yourself telling yourself a story when I ask myself what is the story I'm telling myself right now why am I telling myself this story like where is this coming from and then I encourage myself to take 50 steps backwards and then look at the situation again, and then take like another 50, right? And really look at that context um, and look at something from a different angle because the more we step away from it, the more evidence we have that debunks the story. So it's like watching, you know, if you're like taking a picture of something like a palm tree, which I'm seeing out my window right now, right? Then you just see that palm tree. But if you take a step back, you might see that there's 
a bush next to the palm tree there's a house there's like you know a dog and you start to see there's more there than what meets the eye and i think when we do this for ourselves and the stories we're forming in our head it can start to bring about the peace or at least the option to start to form another story right and like choose choose to focus on the evidence that supports the story you want to bring in now i think there's a balance here because there's also you don't want to be naive right you don't want to you know start to trick yourself into believing something that isn't true but i think this is a particularly helpful exercise when there's a narrative or story that's causing pain or it may not be leading to the place you want to go and that story itself is an insight again those questions of what is the story i'm telling myself why am i telling myself the story because often it may involve another person and maybe that will inspire a conversation with that person to say hey i'm feeling this way like can you help debunk the story with me because sometimes we can't always debunk them ourselves and we want to get that evidence or reassurance from you know a colleague a friend a partner um to to get some facts right that aren't just the stories in our head um yeah but 99 yeah it just won't we can't control it we don't we can't predict the future so treat your mind well right take care of your mind to create the world and those beliefs that are going to drive those actions that you actually want right and don't self-sabotage yourself with your thoughts it's hard it's easier said than done i think um but improv does help that awareness i think of what that story is and what those feelings are attached to that story Mary, you are an improv monk. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that is so lovely. That is so lovely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Well, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you say that because in the mindfulness piece too, right? Because I think, and we've talked a lot about this, the mindfulness aspect of improvising. And the thing that I think improv enabled me or brought me that meditation or yoga or more the, like those practices didn't was the social component, like the interactions with other people. Because like I said earlier, I could feel like I could sense things and I could have this awareness to be like, oh, I don't feel great about the situation, but I didn't have the tools to communicate it or the confidence to communicate it. And I had a lot of fears about communicating it. And that's where improv took it to a whole other level because it is the ability to be mindful in community with other people or with other people and in relationship with people because awareness isn't enough if you can't communicate what is happening that's affected by other people i think yeah i'm so glad that you mentioned that and um i know this is something we talked about a couple of weeks ago on your podcast as well but improv as an external mindfulness practice. And as you mentioned, there are elements that we get from improv that we don't necessarily get from our sitting meditation and vice versa. But specifically, if someone is looking to enhance kind of the mindful communication and connection and play, then improv could be a great avenue for someone, or at least just an alternative to just simply meditation practice. And by the way, shout out to your podcast, Improve, <laughs> which I'll also put in the show notes. It's it's lovely. I'm not just saying that because I was on the show, but I'm a, I'm a fan and I'm a listener as well. Yeah, well, it was great to have you on the show. Um, I mean, I think that more and more, it's like we've talked about, like it's just another tool in the toolkit, right? And for some people, meditation is great and improv can be a great complement to that or if meditation isn't for you or it's not helping you in what you want to achieve like you could try improv right and i and i say that with some caution because i think like you the pin i'll put from earlier around improv being known as this on stage performance uh art form there's not always a ton of great options for practicing improv just to get better at life things, right? There's a lot of options for improv as a way to be better on stage or, you know, be funnier or whatever people, you know, you go to Second City or Ground Lanes and UCB, and I know you and I've trained all these fantastic, well-known theaters. Um, 
but keep that in mind, you know, that, that uh, there are, what you're learning on stage does translate to off stage, right? And I think that over time does start to influence how we show up and that flexibility of mind. And I think that's why I love what you and I both do of bringing these tools as ways to help people you know, navigate difficult conversations, which I learned so much from your session on that, right? And and we do a lot with, you know, leaders and helping people with business skills using improv. And I know we've both done stuff with well-being and mindfulness and mental health. And I think that that for folks that really want to explore improv as a tool for personal and professional transformation, finding those places to practice improv is going to kind of fast track you because people like you and I, right, have connected the dots already for folks to say, here's how this translates so that you don't have to go to just a general improv class and do that translation for yourself. Come, you know, find people like Matt or myself that use have done like, you know, a decade, like years and years of figuring that out. Um, Because you may have, if you're going just to like, you know, get on stage and do the performance thing, do that, right? Those exist out there. Um, But there's ways to kind of fast track that personal or professional transformation by going to the folks that are specifically applying this into that realm, I think. Yeah, thank you. And I I had never quite, I think that was a great way of expressing it, like going to places where someone's going to help you connect the dots um, where that might not happen explicitly in a second city or a groundlings or something like that. So I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Yeah. Cause they're great. They'll, you'll learn a lot. They'll be fun. You'll learn. I mean, it just, I know for me, there's plenty of people I've taken improv classes with that were doing it more for the career aspect of being a performer. And we, they were, they weren't connecting the dots. I was right. And that's, that's one of the beauties of, like you can take it in so many different ways. So it will just make people's lives a little, like it will just make those dots click faster, of like those connections of like, oh, this is how it can help me in life. Or this is a tool I can use to have this conversation in a way that you won't necessarily get in some of those classes, I think. Tell us about Improve, Mary, your company. And I would love to hear how you actually bring this in to corporations and into leadership and um, yeah, walk us through what that looks like. If anyone's listening and they're thinking, wow, improv maybe could be helpful for my team or they're a leader. How, how could I use improv to improve my, my leadership? Can, can you give us a peek on how that works? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we basically help teams manage and thrive to, through change, right. And grow and improve and that can look like a few different ways it usually starts the conversation with a company or team to be like what's going on right what are you trying to improve do you want your team to be working better together are you trying to improve collaboration are you trying to launch a new product and figuring out how do we best set ourselves up for success with that are you wanting to prepare your leaders for being great leaders and managers of people because the number one reason people leave companies is because of their managers. So are you trying to equip your leaders with great communication skills, the ability to manage change and conflict and have an emotional intelligence for showing up with their team? Um, Do you want people to improve their sales and presentations, presentation skills? So it kind of starts with that exploratory call and as you and I probably both know like improv is really flexible. And so then we design a kind of program or experience based on what those goals are and kind of work backwards. And often what that looks like, um, we do offsites. So we've done uh, day long, multi day long offsites where we design and facilitate an offsite that incorporates improv and improv inspired principles and practices along with kind of business and leadership frameworks like radical candor or Clifton strengths or you know, whatever that company is using to help uh, with their team, we kind of bring those worlds together. Um, And then we do trainings like virtual leadership trainings where there's different modules. So um, there's just like leadership skills, communication skills, 
difficult conversations with which I know um, Matt here is going to partner with us on figuring out how to bring improv skills to help leaders have and navigate difficult conversations with their teams. We do uh, innovation, creativity, problem solving sessions. So those modules are customizable for a multi week training virtually or in person. Um, and then we do we end up doing some other stuff that's kind of more custom depending on again the company's needs so i think if you're out there looking for something like this and you want to explore if improv or this kind of improve methodology as we call it like incorporating these principles and practices to help companies navigate and change and thrive through change um reach out we can have a conversation and see see what we can do to improve together Lovely. And in addition to all of the very practical and meaningful ways that improv affects teams and companies and helps them to survive and thrive, it's simply just so much fun to do with a team. I mean, it just to bring really that is. laughter in. It is. I like to say it's like giving people a uh, vegetable or candy that's packed with vegetables and vitamins, right? It's like, it's fun and it's good for you. So you can't go wrong. So I wanted to ask you about uh, if you could say just a word or two on some of the research that you've been involved in, particularly around uh, improv and how it affects certain life outcomes, including our our physical health. Um, Can you say a little bit? I know the actually, I'm not sure where the paper's at, if it's published or not, because it's been a while since we've talked about it. But um, give us a little snapshot of like what you guys did and, and what you found in that study. Yeah, of course. And trust me, you will know when it's published. I will, you'll be one of the first people I contact about it. It is in the process. Um, We ran a study looking at improvising's impact on physiological health. I partnered with a neuroscientist and we designed the study together and we used the aura ring to measure heart rate variability, sleep quality, uh, physical activity levels, and then we did some assessments to look at, um, I think we use like uh, different scales around anxiety, depression, well-being, cheerfulness. Um, and then we did a kind of after each of the six sessions, it was a six week study. Uh, we asked people to record how they felt before and after each class, like in terms of I think happiness, sadness, like feeling part of a group lonely and so forth, creative. And so we looked at some qualitative and quantitative measures of health and well-being and how improvising impacted that over time. And we ran um, a six week course, people around the world joined. And then we, you know, took that data. We looked at what were those improvements or changes. And I mean, I'm not, I, I won't, share all of the results, but I would encourage everyone to to reach out if you'd like to learn more um, when that does get published. But I will say that uh, there were improvements to sleep quality, physical activity levels, and people reported feeling less lonely. They felt more connected, more part of a group. Um, those were some of the highlights. So there was there was some evidence that improvising does improve physiological health over time. And that definitely inspired more curiosity to keep studying this and look more like what else can we learn about improv as a way to improve health and have some real data and science behind it. Because I think that's also what led meditation to be as popular of a tool today is the more research, the more science that was shown about it, the more people were like, yeah, I'm going to try this. So that was part of the inspiration for the study. Also, just I'm like, I know this does, I see it, you know, but I want some proof. <laughs> and so hopefully there'll be enough, uh, something that people can read soon to learn more about that. But the the headline is that it's pretty cool to see that it does, it does show improvements. So if you want to sleep better, you know, drink chamomile tea and take an improv class. <laughs> And you and I can both attest uh, to those benefits, <laughs> but it's it's nice to see some some research out there uh, backing that. And this is a, a slow but growing field. And I know I've heard you say multiple times that you 
feel like this is kind of the next wave almost of like mindfulness research. And I'm equally as, as excited about um, research on improv for, um, for all the reasons that we've, we've talked about today. Absolutely. And I think the more we get, the more we do it, the more there'll be more information, more people will try it and it will just kind of create that flywheel that's happened with meditation and help people, right? That experience the benefits that you, I, and, and so many others have in their lives and their work and their well being. So that's the big thing, right? Is I just, that's what motivates me during the hard times when I'm like, this is, I know this helps people and I know it will, right? And it's just a matter of continuing to find ways to share it. And I think what you're doing with the show and with both of our works is so great because we are finding ways to connect people with this tool that they may not have otherwise realized could be more than just fun and games. It is fun and games and it will help you sleep better. (laughs) (laughs) Although I have to say, and I can attest to sleeping better just simply by virtue of feeling less stressed out while I take improv classes. Although when I come home from improv after like a groundlings class, my routine is actually, I have to stay up and watch two episodes of Seinfeld (laughs) so that my brain can wind down because I'm so amped up from the class and I'm processing so much like information. Um, So I, I have like a wind down routine. So I'll just caveat with that, like the night of improv, but that being said, those classes ended at like 10 30, um, at night. Um, but the next day I would always just feel fantastic and so sharp and had so much energy just coming off of like that improv high. Um, so it definitely carries forward in, into the week in a positive way. I'm so glad you brought that up. I think there needs to be a look at like the timing of that when you take an improv class will definitely determine how you sleep because there is some adrenaline to it. Right. And, And a lot of improv theaters have late night improv classes. I'm like, give me like a brunch time, right? Like (laughs) 11 a.m. to 2. And it will kind of give you that energy throughout the day or a morning improv class. Because think about, I mean, that's usually when people do yoga often meditate too. It's like it's a morning thing. So maybe we can bring bring back or bring into the improv world a morning improv class <laughs> i was like, just thinking that let's get that going mary like improv and coffee you know to start your day or something or that actually might be yeah. too stimulating but improv yeah. <laughs> in the morning uh before work or you know whatever it is um yeah yeah i love it you could you could replace your coffee with improv it will give you that energy and then it will help you sleep well that night exactly um last question for you mary so um is the game this weekend or next weekend, Michigan and Ohio State? Uh, next weekend, the weekend after Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. How are you feeling about it? Are you, and how are you feeling about your chances this year? So, so Mary went to University of Michigan. I went to Michigan State University. Um, we did not, we both grew up in Michigan, not too far from each other. We didn't know each other growing up until out. We, now we both live in Los Angeles. Um, but uh, what are, what do you think the, the chances are for U of M making the college football playoff? It's looking pretty good. It's looking pretty good. I know there's some, I'm not an expert by all means. I feel like uh, there should be, there could be a whole podcast episode with someone that really knows this better than I do to, to share the like stats. But um, I know there's there's been like some drama in the Michigan football season with the coach getting suspended and sign stealing. So it's I think it's it's not a game to miss. But if you have tickets and you want to sell them to me at face value, I will buy them from you. Um, because they are harder to get than tickets to see Taylor Swift in concert. Allegedly. Is that right? Oh, I don't know, <laughs> but it's hard. <laughs> it's a it's I, a coveted game. I mean, both Michigan State or Michigan and Ohio State are undefeated. They've had great seasons. It's already a rivalry, and now the coach has been suspended. So I think it's just added to the mix of this like excitement about it, and it will be the coldest game of the year. So I guess there's that too to add into the mix that you know, Thanksgiving weekend, but I, of course, believe in the Wolverines and will be cheering for for them, whether I'm at the game or watching it from somewhere warmer and possibly drier. <laughs> well, I will be pulling for you guys, that's for sure, even though we're 
crosstown rivals, there's definitely some some brotherly love there. So I know who I'll be pulling for. That I always I always cheer for Michigan State against Ohio State too. We can be especially uh, against Ohio State. No, yeah. especially against Ohio. <laughs> it's only when we play each other where there's like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna cheer for my own team. But that's right. Otherwise, there is that uh, the Michigan Michigan State appreciation and support. Yes. Um, fantastic. Well, um, anything else, Mary, that we haven't covered today that would be helpful to share uh, with our audience? I mean, yes. And I think we've said a lot too. Um, but I'll thank you for inspiring this conversation and asking such great questions and having me on the show. I feel like it's one of many that um, we've had and will have. And if you're out there listening, and you're like curious, I'd say reach out to either Matt or I or both of us and chat, you know, explore it because, you know, you don't know until you try it. It's just like that gelato free sample. Like maybe you're not ready to like get the full cup because you're like not sure you haven't tried it before. And you're like, what's gelato or gelato as many people would pronounce it as in Michigan, (laughs) but try it, you know, find a way to try a sample, right? And just check it out and see because that's, I mean, look where it, look where it's led people, right? And it's led to some really cool impacts in life. So try a little sample if you're curious and go from there. Sample some of Mary's improv classes, just like you'd take a sample of gelato or gelato. And <laughs> yeah. I have to say too, I mean, on that point, for people who are maybe curious about taking an improv class, but have never taken a class before, if you take a class with Mary or myself or someone like us, um, you know, I, I can, I can say very confidently that we at least attempt to create a very safe, um, and supportive space for people, especially when they're first jumping into the class. And whereas, you know, some other classes, not to say that those are not supportive spaces, but it's very performance focused and our classes are very more, much more focused on personal development. And with that in mind, um, we really, you know, are mindful of people's experiences and their emotions and how difficult it is and how scary and anxiety provoking it is to step into this work. Um, and Mary, you know, I've worked with you a lot and, and, uh, it's, I I would definitely encourage people to, to reach out because I think it's, it can, it can be a really nice opportunity. And once, once you break through that first exercise, then you're just, you're smooth sailing. Like it, not to say that it's not scary as you go along, but the confidence is there. Like, Oh my God, I can do this. This is fun. And it doesn't matter if I mess up or fail. Um, so, um, it's just that first little, little baby step. And I think, um, you, myself and other people like us is a great place to start. Absolutely. I might be a little biased, but <laughs> Well said. I think uh, it's really well said. And um, I'll just second that. Yeah, it's fantastic. So where can people find more about you, about your company, your podcast? I will include all these things in the show notes. But if you just want to direct people, what's the best way to to find you and to get in contact with you? Yeah, I mean, you can go to chooseimprove.com for the website and the podcast is on there as well. And then you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Mary Lemmer, and love to connect, love to chat. Um, there's stuff on the website. There's we have a we have a weekly Substack for those of you that use Substack, where each week um, we send out a written improvisation, so an activity that you can do in your life, in your work, that is just kind of an easy few minutes, um, and that's free and then if you want to subscribe as a paid member you can get a weekly video that will like lead you through the exercise or an exercise to help improve creativity or connection or confidence or gratitude or whatever it is that week so i think that's like a great way to kind of get started if you're if you're curious and want to see how you might apply this to your own life and work and that you can find from the website chooseimprove.com or it's like chooseimprove.substack.com if you want to go directly to it. But that's uh, it's kind of like a weekly newsletter, but really practical activities and reflections you can do that are improv inspired. Mary Lemmer, Improv Monk, thank you so much <laughs> for all of your words of wisdom. 
And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, to continuing our conversations together. So thank you so much. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me on the show.